Hi, my name is Patrick Kennedy, and I'm a staff member here at Salem Access TV. Here in Salem, we have a very vibrant arts community. We have lots of local authors, artists, musicians, and a lot more. And today, I want to bring you, Salem, something very special. We have a local author, Gail Spilsbury, author of a new book called That Year in Boston. Welcome, Gail. I'm glad to be here. <laughs> Thank you for having me. Oh, of course. So, you, you've written some books in, your, in the past, and this is your fourth book, but your first novel. That's right. So, uh, and that, as I understand it, all of your books share one thing in common, a place. They do. Uh, everywhere I have lived, I've enjoyed looking into the history of my surroundings. I majored in history in college and graduate school and have always been fascinated to dig into what makes the place what it is today, what's behind the scenes. <laughs> Nice. Now, uh, one of your books about uh, short stories called the Sabina Quartet takes place in the hills outside of Rome. Can you tell me a little bit about this? Yes. I lived outside of Rome for three years in the Olive Hills called the Sabina Hills. And I lived on a little farm with 65 trees and I made olive oil, uh, about uh, 50 liters for three years, and it was delicious. Wow! So you got to uh, you got to enjoy the olive oil as well that you made. Now, is this stuff olive oil that was actually exported out at all? No, or? it was enough to keep you in olive oil for the year, and people <laughs> really did pour it over their food there. And I continue to do that a little bit. I dribble it over my food still, but it does not taste like the olive uh, oil. No, not not quite like the olive oil no, from Italy. No. <laughs> Well, that, that sounds like a great experience. And now you also have another book called Washington Sketchbook, which takes, uh, takes you around the natural beauty of Washington, D.C. Can you tell me a little bit about that? Yes. While I was living in D.C., because I worked there for part of my career before coming to Massachusetts, I discovered some old drawings in the Library of Congress, and they were of natural scenery and landmarks around D.C. So for about eight months between jobs, I worked in museums, I went out and researched those places, gathered information, and people had not written about natural Washington very much, <laughs> these specific places and trails, and I made a book out of it with the drawings and what I could find about those places. That, that's really nice because, you know, you think of Washington, D.C. as the nation's capital and, you know, with buildings and museums and things like that, but you kind of forget about the naturality of, of everything around the Virginia and D.C. area. And you, being from there, know how beautiful <laughs> it is. Yes. The main, it's so close to the city. Mm -hmm. You go out that CNO Canal Trail and you are seeing wilderness. <laughs> well, this leads me to uh, one of your other books, which had a lot about uh, wilderness. It was called Rock Creek Park. Can you tell me a little bit about yes. this book? Well, Rock Creek Park is a large urban park, one of the biggest in the United States for an urban park, and it's left completely natural. There are no intrusions to build uh, restaurants or anything commercial in it. And I wrote a book about it because the Olmsted family was involved in writing a report about it in 1918 and the report said, never change this park, always keep it natural the way it is. So that today, whenever there's a controversy about managing the park, they bring out this report and <laughs> say, but Olmsted said, you cannot change this park. Oh, nice. Mm -hmm. And it's still natural. <laughs> well, that's good to hear. So now, you spent years working in an ed editor at the Smithsonian, mm -hmm. the National Gallery of Art and National Geographic, and now you join us here in the city of Salem working at the wonderful Peabody Essex Museum. Can you tell me a little bit about that too? Well, it's been wonderful. <laughs> I've been here almost a year and I love the museum, the projects I have, I love the collection, I love my colleagues, and I have to say I love Salem, the North Shore, and part of that is all the history here. I'm fascinated by it. Can't get enough of it. Exactly, and you know, Salem obviously has a lot of history and now, do you think your next book might have a little bit to do with Salem? Well, I do think about that sometimes, <laughs> and I keep collecting books, and they are growing on my shelf, and I'm not sure what that book might be, but I know it will be fiction, and it will have to do with something about the literary history here, 
or the, the people who populate it? The, that would be uh, great. I know obviously there's uh, there's quite a number of books about Salem about different things, you know, <laughs> but uh, I think that would be very good about the literary history because, mm -hmm. you know, there's a lot of different histories here in Salem. So. I agree. <laughs> it's been a wonderful so, place. So now moving on from Salem, let's talk about this little city that we're next to called Boston. Yes. And that, that's the place of your book. Right that year in Boston. Mm -hmm. Can you tell me a little bit uh, about that? Yes, well, that's a place, and it's a place <laughs> I love dearly, and it became the centerpiece of my novel. I grew up in Massachusetts in a town called Milton on the South Shore, yeah. and uh, spent a lot of time in Boston. My dad worked at the MGH hospital, so we were in Boston a lot, and recently I came back to Boston, not for Penn, but my kids had grown up and I moved back, and I just love Beacon Hill. So I decided to set my novel on Beacon Hill and my protagonist, Nick Turner, lives on Beacon Hill and every day he has to cross through Boston Garden to get to his job at Copley Square. Oh, nice. Right. So those <laughs> scenes turn up a lot in the book and I thought maybe I could start by reading a scene. Of course, I, I would love to hear an example okay. about Boston from your book. All right, and I, I have several different passages at the beginning of the book that describe Boston and Beacon Hill in the garden and wanted to read a rather short one. Okay. And it's because Nick, Nick uh, crosses through the garden on his way to work. Nick put away his phone and skirted through rush hour traffic at the insane intersection separating Boston Common from the public garden. He loved this swath of land, Boston's historic heart. Just as the common had once served as pasture for the colonists' livestock, it now served local residents' dogs, which romped on the open slopes at each end of the day. Anything public, from a concert to a protest, happened on the common. The garden, in contrast, was a refined landscape with tree species labeled and signs posted to keep off the grass. A fairy book iron bridge painted robin's egg blue crossed a dreamy lagoon where in summertime the famous swan boats glided and real swans bathed. This was the strolling territory of minds like Henry James and Nick always felt the Victorian heyday when he crossed through the garden. That's very picturesque and I can almost picture the scene of uh, the Boston Common and the, Bo and the garden right there uh, because you know, just walking through it, especially in the summertime, you get the smells and the scenes, mm -hmm. and it's just so beautiful. Um, so now, what else inspired you to write this book about Boston, besides just your love for the city and the park and everything? Well, um, I a lot of things inspired me, and most of them come from experience in my personal life. It's not autobiography, but I like to think of my experiences, my memories, my imaginings, things that are fictional or fantasies, and even thinking that I do in midlife, all of that was feeding into something that came out as fiction, <laughs> which to me is like alchemy, but going yep. through the human body and mind. <laughs> now, is there an example of this transformation or taking this real experience and putting it into novel or fiction form? Yes. Well, I'll give one example. There are many examples because I cover several topics in the book. But one, the one I'd like to talk about is love. There's a love story in the book because I found that my readers like the love story. They always bring it up. <laughs> oh, I couldn't stop reading the love story. <laughs> So I was very interested in the idea of mid midlife love and falling in love because it's completely different from when you're young and fall in love. And so I created Nick who was in his mid 50s and divorced and Flo, another editor, they're both editors at a publishing house in Boston. Okay. And she's 40 and married. And in the relationship that they develop a very passionate, love, it's completely different from when you're young. And I realized by following their love story that it has to do with age and wisdom. And these things are missing when you're young. So that was something that I explored. Okay. Now, uh, I believe that, I think next, I'd like to hear an, another excerpt oh. from the book. Mm -hmm. And uh, maybe uh, <laughs> we can get to know uh, 
Nick or Flo? Right. Well, <laughs> I think that this will show a little bit, maybe not their passionate love. The readers will have to read the book to find <laughs> that out. But in this excerpt, Flo is in her element. She's been brought from New York to be editor-in-chief at Churchill and Company because it's going under. And she's brought in as a New York pro, and she's going to turn the place around. She's got ideas for trendy lines of mm -hmm. books that have <laughs> nothing to do with the past traditions of Churchill. And people really do admire her and like her because she's a personality. And Nick, of course, slowly falls in love with her. He's trying to resist her because she's married. But I wanted to read a passage about Flo in her element in the publishing house. Flo entered the room at last. Nick, and probably everyone else, inhaled her. She was like a star actress, an eager audience has been waiting a lifetime to see in person. She moved across the room, her stage, with a proud, assured step, shoulders and pelvis tipped slightly forward in the fashion model style smile brilliant, head flicking her loose sable hair over her shoulders as she called out the friendliest hellos, as if blowing kisses to one and all. How easily her pulsing persona could melt even the hardest hearts, Nick thought, glancing around at the sober faces of the company leaders, stiff blue-blooded yanks. Their features had softened to childlike pleasure under Flo's glowing force. I'm just delighted to present to you our latest photography book, this one co-published with the Wycliffe Gallery in New York, which all of you know about, so I don't have to explain, except to say, of all the galleries in the world devoted to photography, the Wycliffe is my own personal favorite, and not because I'm a New Yorker. The truth is, I don't know of any other venue that can come close to competing with its stature and also its connection to the very best photographers on the planet, from Australia to London to South Africa and, of course, New York. So we at Churchill can be proud to offer this new book on trees, I should say mind-blowing images of trees, to anyone who loves gazing at beauty, loves appreciating the miracle of trees in every season, including winter, when the branches become delicate, fragile webs. She stopped to gaze at a spread showing snow-covered trees. Her voice purred on. The book makes you long for winter to come just so you can stare at bare trees against a blue sky or shimmering under a coat of ice, even though we all know that beautiful ice like that kills a tree if it doesn't melt fast enough. But oh my God, the sight of trees coated in wet glittering ice sends shivers down my spine. It's a vision to die for. She resumed her stroll of the room, left hand waving at the pictures. As you can see, Fran has pulled off yet another design feat with this book. Congratulations, Fran. She's managed to make every picture receive its due honor on the page. And Lori has come up with a jacket that's definitely going to bowl over juries in all the contests we're going to enter this book in. And Nick has kindly pitched in and fixed up Michael Green's incredibly bad text so that now it reads like poetry which is appropriate coming from our resident poet, in case you didn't know that about Nick. Her eyes and smile flicked mischievously at him while she continued without a pause. Thanks to our amazing and hardworking team for producing yet another Churchill smash hit. We hope everyone loves the book as much as we do. It's destined to be the new standard bearer in our photography category and for all publishers who hope to compete. Best of all, Wycliffe is paying most of the bill. We have Ruth and her unparalleled negotiating powers to thank for that. The gray heads of the top executives nodded. They reiterated, reiterated thanks. Everyone murmured praise for the book. Nick wondered whether the room's attention was arrested by the photographs on the walls or by Flo's graceful movements, which seemed choreographed to her eloquence. She now waited expectantly, her ageless smile traveling from face to face. Nick, what do you think? She said almost gaily. So Nick and Flo fall in love. It's an office love story. <laughs> it is an office love story. Uh, and I want to say that it, it is a large part of the book that compels readers along, but there's a lot else in there that uh, meant a lot to me and from aging to taking care of elderly parents to ch raising children with bipolar things like that now is this the plot that drives the rest of the book 
Well, the plot that drives the rest of the book is not the love story, but a book that Flo brings in, and it's a memoir thriller based in Brazil, and she hastily acquires it to make a success of Churchill, to bring in millions of dollars, and she does it too quickly, and it turns out that the memoir is false, and it involves a drug <laughs> cartel story. So it brings scandal momentarily to Churchill and company. I could read a, a piece about that book uh, and how Flo rushed it through. The book is called Island Peril, Okay. And as I said, it's a thriller memoir written by a ghost writer who's a New York Times Pulitzer Prize winning writer. <laughs> and he's kind of disappeared off the map into Iraq and they can't really track him down. But the man who told him the story lives in Brazil. Island Peril had moved ahead before Thanksgiving, cutting standard steps, such as proper legal review, all because of Flo's arm-waving assurances. The book has a Pulitzer Prize winning author, for cripe's sake, she bleated. Editorial work had begun even before Chad and John signed contracts. Nick had assigned the book to Liza Metcalf because of her erudition. He had wanted to test the book out on a critical reader and wasn't surprised when her spare figure and graying ponytail came to his office door within 24 hours, manuscript in hand to say, Nick, do you really believe this story? I think it's embellished to say the least. It might seem fine to an average reader, she said, but anyone who thinks is going to question the facts. It doesn't add up. Please tell Flo that. I will. But Flo was in a hurry, eager to show her superiors and the world that she could produce a blockbuster on a crash schedule. I have instincts about this book, Nick, and they're good, or the book's good. The writing's really good. Why don't we send it back to Chad and John and ask for a novel? She shook her head. True stories get devoured by everyone, men, women, Oprah, filmmakers. They had plunged ahead, with Flo asking Fran to make the layout a priority. Fran had finished the design in two days, again, all before Thanksgiving. Susie Mumford had handled the workflow from there, dealing with an outside copy editor and proofreader who were willing to work during the holidays. Now, the second week in January, the book was at the printers. Press releases sat ready for the advanced copies that would be sent to reviewers and booksellers. Never had Churchill produced a book so fast. That was the power of Flo's influence. I like it. It's almost like a book within a book. Yes, <laughs> yes. Now, um, it sounds like that year in Boston color covers some ground. You pay homage to the city, you talk about today's book publishing world, you have some scandal, and you even have a little bit of a steamy love story. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I do. And then there's the bipolar story. And I think that that one, um, I felt the, the deepest kind of pain for because I had to live through Nick's experiences of raising a bipolar daughter. And Emily is 25 and she's, um, a high achieving young woman despite these bouts of mania and depression that she gets. And in the story, Nick is trying to resist Flo's allure <laughs> and slowly he, his resistance wears down and right at that moment, Emily erupts in a manic episode and Nick has to run out on the streets trying to find her to get her off the streets. She's crazy and he doesn't find her and he drives back home thinking about all they've been through over the years. And that was a piece of the book I wanted to read. Please go ahead. I think a lot of parents um, experience similar things. Mm -hmm. Nick's thoughts ran fast through his head as he drove across Longfellow Bridge to home, scrutinizing the sidewalks for Emily. When they went to the movies, they often walked over the bridge at night and once she had stopped to look down at the black, choppy waters. How do people like Virginia Woolf stuff their pockets with stones and drown? She had shuddered and moved on. I couldn't die that way. He wanted to trust their pack that she would call him if she ever got that close to suicide. But he knew that a person in the throes of insanity would never remember a pack. To his amazement, Emily was sitting on his stoop when he came along the cold night street from the garage. Her cheetah legs had brought her there. She looked like a derelict, disheveled, eyes ultra watchful, face unsmiling, even hostile. But if she was feeling hostile to the him, why was she there? 
He sat down next to her, put his arm around her. How are you? She stared straight ahead, didn't answer. An unlit cigarette dangled from her right hand. He knew words coming from him entered her ears, but with all kinds of potential distortions, and her responses would be automatic, not real responses, for her mind at that moment was whirling at breakneck speed like an LP playing at 78 RPM. It left her no opening to process rationally and respond. And besides, everyone was an enemy out to trick her. Let's go inside. No. He was so afraid of pushing the button that would make her leap up and run away that he sat there racking his brain about what to do. He needed to get her to the hospital but the mention of that word or any word related to helping her would set her off. We can make some tea, relax on the couch, watch a movie. I like it here. Her brief glances at him showed a frozen face, steely, impenetrable eyes. He couldn't find the human in her, and that was the danger. Mass General was a few blocks away, but he wanted to get her to McLean, where they had her records and where she could stay until well again. Emmy, we need to help you. How? You're the devil. Everyone's the devil. Before he could think of an appropriate response, she got up, thin as a rail and deer-like. Let's walk, she said, setting off down the hill toward the river. The river. How he feared it. He went right after her, his mind racing for solutions. He hoped that at Charles Street he would see a cop car and ask for help. But it was a freezing night, and the usual nightlife was dead. He needed the police or an ambulance. Reigning in Emily was beyond his power. But he also knew that the tactics of the police would set her off. She would kick and scream, fight for her freedom, and then they would face another kind of arrest for assault and courtroom ordeals once she got out of McLean. He had to get her himself through peaceful means. He was running to keep up with her. She was on the bridge, flailing her arms and yelling at the world for all its stupidities and atrocities. When she got to the other side, with him calling futilely after her, he knew it was hopeless. She was disappearing into the night, and her mind was gone. No good could come of it unless she landed in a place to rest, a safe haven. Panting, he came to a slow stop and watched her rapidly recede down Main Street. He did not call 9-11, and he knew Charlotte would denounce him the next day for that failure. But he'd ride that tide. Much as he had just lost Emily, something else had happened. He had placed faith in the kernel of sanity that still dwelled somewhere in her recesses. He placed faith in her ability to survive the night out there on the frozen streets. She would go home to Eric, or she would go somewhere familiar because she knew it was best to be safe. She knew her father was counting on her good sense. Again, I can almost picture that in my head and see that happening in a city like Boston. You know, and it sounds like a very dramatic scene. I think it is, and just reading it, anytime I reread it, I, I feel the intensity of it. And I'd like to add that the next day, Nick does find Emily and is able to get help for her. And there is help for Emily, and there's help for other people like Emily. Mm -hmm. And the world needs to do as much as it can, society, to get help for people. Yeah, and yeah. you know, I that that's obviously another point that your your book brings up is the positivity of this, and you know, being able to help people who you know might uh, think that they aren't going to be able to be helped. Right. So. <laughs> yes, this feeling of um, community and familial help. It's really, there's a very closeness between the father and daughter. And it, that is upbeat. I also want to say that <laughs> though there are some heavy things in the book, uh, there are a lot of humorous parts mm -hmm. and even, well, lighter sides. And I thought today we might end on one of the lighter scenes in the book, which happens earlier on. Okay, well, we've already been through a, a good picturesque scene of uh, the Boston Common. And then we've been through this scene. I would love to. Uh, I'd love to hear a, a light and kind of airy scene because okay. you know I think Boston 
has all of that to it. Just the city of Boston, you know, it's intense at times, it's funny at times, and it's beautiful or dark at times too. It's so. true. <laughs> like a lot of life. I mean, yeah, I think definitely. the book talks about a lot of life. In this scene that I'll read to you, it's Thanksgiving time, and Nick goes to see his, goes to spend the holiday with his parents in Marion. I created a retirement home for the parents and set it in Marion. Mainly Marion, Massachusetts. Massachusetts okay. Near the shore, mainly because Nick's mother comes from New Bedford and his father always spent summers in Marion. It's all made up, but so oh. I set the <laughs> retirement home there like they could go there at the end of their lives. And it's called Ballard Hill Farm, okay. and it's very nice. And Anne, Nick's older sister, they're only two children in the family, they're both in midlife. Um, she comes down from Maine every year, she's divorced too, and she and Nick have Thanksgiving with the parents. Meanwhile, Emily and her live-in boyfriend, who's a rock musician, Eric, <laughs> decide to come also because Emily's mother, Charlotte, uh, got the flu and was unable to host her usual Thanksgiving oh, okay. dinner. So this is when the new configuration arrives at Ballard Hill Farm <laughs> for Thanksgiving. The intercom phone rang to announce the arrival of Emily and Eric. A moment later, they breezed through the front door, Emily first, her face alight with her mother's sweet smile. Eric, long hair curling into his untrimmed beard, followed like a shadow, clearly a misfit in the sedate, antique-filled apartment. Everyone looks straight through Emily to her shaggy companion and his rotting sneakers. His hemless jeans showed frayed holes in the thighs, and his black Metallica t-shirt was emblazoned with the words, Metal up your ass, with a graphic showing a to toilet bowl with a sword sticking up out of it. Nick closed his eyes. Why was Eric wearing such a shirt on Thanksgiving Day? If asked, he would feign nonchalance, pure innocence. Oh, I wasn't thinking. This was on the top of the pile. But the truth was, he was still going through his adolescent rebellious stage at age 25. In contrast, Emily's vintage wool skirt that came almost to her ankles, laced black boots and gray blouse with pleated front would pass muster in the dining room. In fact, Nick smiled to himself, she looked as Victorian as her namesake from Amherst, and she had appeal. Valerie, who's the grandmother, had to finish her thrilled hugs and kisses with her granddaughter before any other greetings could take place. Then she turned to Eric and said as she gave him a perfunctory hug, sorry, buddy, but the dining room won't admit you in that getup. I tried to get him to change, Emily said. What's wrong with my clothes, Eric said. This is how people in my profession dress, and no one tells us we have to change. Where do you come from, Sheldon growled. Sheldon's the grandfather. Eric's hackles went up, but his voice kept calm. I live with Emily in Somerville. I mean your family, your father. Where did you grow up, the Bronx? Granddad, Emily warned. His dad teaches at Harvard Law School, Shell, Valerie said dryly. He's lived in Cambridge his whole life, except when I went to Brown, Eric said, which only lasted two years. Sheldon's eyebrows shot up, a college dropout like himself. Is this how your family dresses on Thanksgiving Day? What is this, an interrogation all because I like to dress like myself? I happen to have band practice right after this. He's a drummer, Valerie said. Oh, percussion, Sheldon said drearily and turned away to limp back to his comfortable armchair. Sheldon, Eric's going to need some duds, Valerie said. Grumbles could be heard in response as Sheldon settled into the soft upholstery. Dad, I can help Eric borrow a few things, okay? Old stuff you don't use anymore, Anne said. Anne, the therapist, who mediated troubled families for her daily bread. For Christ's sakes, he's going to need shoes, goddammit, and I know he's got an incurable fungus from walking around 24-7 in those hideous things he's wearing. What an idiot. Granddad just talks like that, Emily said to Eric, who was staring open-mouthed at Sheldon. Yeah, you warned me, but this was Eric's first face-to-face -face interaction with Sheldon. A grin suddenly broke over the renegade's face, and he sang to Emily the old Marvin Gaye and Tammy Terrell lyric, Ain't nothing like the real thing, baby. Nick saw Anne smile. She always had a heart for the underdog. Hey, Eric said with sudden inspiration, maybe I'll get a new song out of this little holiday, the Ballard Ballad. 
and Sheldon would be the protagonist, a star at last, Nick said to himself. Eric, follow me, Anne said. We can fix you up a bit for the dining room. As long as it's not too extreme, Eric said. They were gone after that, and for a fair amount of time, though their voices could be heard from the bedroom, Eric's deep and glib, and Anne's also deep but measured. It was a compatible exchange, whatever they were actually saying, probably the pros and cons of a solid versus a striped shirt and which pants would match, then the shoes. A few smirks could be heard from Eric and made Nick think the young freewheeler had rejected Sheldon's wingtips from the 50s and his shiny penny loafers from the 60s. After that, their voices vanished into the bathroom for grooming around the face. Eric's long locks were only a few stages from becoming dreads. Meanwhile, Valerie took the opportunity to have a fast one-on-one -on -one conversation with Emily. Nick went to the adjacent kitchenette for a glass of water, then washed the breakfast dishes in the sink to keep out of the living room a bit longer. His mother sounded satisfied to hear Emily's repeated confirmations that she was doing well and no, her depression was much better. Her mind was focused on getting into grad school and starting a new life. Yes, things were going well with Eric too. He was okay. In fact, she loved him, at least right now. His clothes and beard didn't bother her. Most of her guy friends dressed like that. And besides, what was important was their friendship. They could talk. Well, being able to talk is important, Valerie said. But Emmy, it's obvious he's far beneath you, Sheldon cut in loudly, no doubt hoping Eric would hear. He's F-word dirty. Granddad, be quiet. He can hear you. When I was a total mess last year, Eric took care of me. And when he went through a bad spell the year before, I took care of him. We remember that. That's definitely the wrong reason to be in a relationship, Sheldon objected. What do you mean? Love is about caring and helping, besides other things. It deepens bonds. Besides, you don't know anything about, about what happened to me last year. Sheldon backed off and Nick conveniently came back into the room with a tray of ice water for everyone. No way he wanted Emmy telling his parents the details of last year's crisis. So, Gail, that, uh, <laughs> I get a very clear picture in my head of family and Thanksgiving and, uh, you know, things that can, uh, that can go wrong or be funny. And I think that definitely shows a lighter side to your book. So, it does. It does. <laughs> so, uh, Gail, again, I would like to thank you for coming here and spending some time at, at Salem Access TV. Well, thank you. I really <laughs> enjoyed being here. And now, um, could you tell the public a little bit about, do you have like a Facebook or a website or mm -hmm. anything that people can contact yes you on? I think on Facebook by typing in that year in Boston okay. the Facebook landing page will turn up and um, there's a YouTube video a trailer for the book on YouTube that year in Boston a novel and it's on Amazon I have an author's page there oh on Amazon.com mm -hmm. that's great that, that's a great way to uh, sell books in uh, <laughs> in the new age now uh, is there any places around Salem that people can pick up your books yes there are um, it's available right on Pickering Wharf at Joyful Artisans, a okay. boutique, and it's also available at the new bookstore on Derby, on Essex Street, yep. called Wicked Good Books. Wicked Good Books. And it's available <laughs> on Amazon, and it's available in Boston at several bookstores. I would hope so, being called that year in Boston, right. that would be available in Boston. It is. All right, Salem, well, I hope you enjoyed that, and it sounds like a very interesting book. And here at Salem Access TV, we love to promote the arts, the community, and everything that goes on. So, on behalf of Salem Access TV, I'm Patrick Kennedy, and I hope you get out and do some more artful things. See you later.